Hello, dandies. Welcome back to the show. Today we have on Carl Eugene Stroud. You may know him from before. He's been on the show to talk about militancy. He's been on the show to talk about Sartre. And today, uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about. I thought he'd just come on and hang out for a bit. Not really. Um, This is going to be part three of the Sartre series. And we're going to be focused on book four which is on collectives. And uh, this is where Sartre's writing in Critique of Dialectical Reason seems to have some applicability to anarchist uh, theory and practice. So finally, we're getting there. And Carl is going to lead the way on most of that because uh, I've been entirely busy with work and other things it's been kind of ridiculous but um yeah so welcome aboard carl to the ship yeah thanks for for having me back it's uh you know haven't talked about haven't haven't really dealt with uh that text since the last time we talked which like we said was yeah about almost a year and a half ago now so it's something i've been reading for a really long time but yeah i don't just spend a lot of time on regularly so it's good to kind of get back to a bit yeah it's and you know i've been reading like prudhomme heavily only because i've been debating marxists about it and uh oddly enough there's some similarities here but yeah i haven't really read it since the last time we talked either so um I made the mistake of going back to page one and taking detailed notes uh, with like, I don't know, probably a hundred quotes that I've written down and trying to summarize everything. And uh, long story short, I didn't even get to the chapter that we're talking about. So to kind of even this out a little bit, I guess what we'll do is a quick recap of some of the topics of the last two parts of this and then we'll get to book four yeah that sounds good i th- i think that maybe the the recap can serve as like uh, our version of uh one of these you know four or five page paragraphs because in, in my reading like uh there was there was a point when i got to uh this one paragraph that was like eight pages and i was like i don't know how i'm gonna do it and i sat on that eight pages for a long time and i was like you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna skip that paragraph and i'm gonna go on and then i'll come back to that paragraph and there's that footnotes that are three pages long in this yeah. text it's like uh so anyway for uh for anyone who doesn't remember much which i would hope is everyone because it's been a year um Critique of Dialectical Reason is Sartre's attempt to deal with dialectics, period, reasoning in a dialectical way. And he begins the book by critiquing different ways that dialectical reasoning has been carried out, whether it's been Hegelian or Marxist or uh, Stalinist, which would be kind of like what the dialectical materialism that Engels um, came up with in the dialectics of nature and then was used as kind of the uh, standard idea of dialectics and under Stalin. Um, Basically, Sartre is making the point that you're going to wind up at some kind of idealistic dialectic unless you root dialectics in praxis. And the reason, you know, he has all sorts of reasons for this. One of the big ones is that, you know, his idea of being and truth not being parallel. So one of the things he'll say is being outstrips truth. This goes back to, you know, uh, his being in nothingness. Basically, the idea is existence precedes essence. Uh, being precedes knowledge thing you know things happen first then afterwards comes knowledge of it uh that's a problem for hegelianism and it's a problem for some other types of monism because they tend to think of those two things as uh simultaneously happening which 
leads to a perspective from outside and not a perspective that's imminent or being in the world or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so he establishes this uh, throughout the introduction to the text and then, you know, emphasizes that the dialectic needs to be a materialist dialectic and uh, and then he starts from, you know, looking at the individual and individual praxis. And he does this for me uh, methodological reasons. He does not do this because he's an individualist. One thing that he says is that there really isn't uh, a real individual. That's just an abstraction. But we need to start there because in order to arrive at an apodictic certainty of dialectical reason, we need to start with the individual and the way that the individual totalizes uh, and retotalizes the world that they're embedded in. So basically the main point is that dialectical reasoning depends on this notion of the whole or the total that you really can't arrive at dialectics from, from like analytical reason because analytical, analytical reason will never give you uh, necessity in the sense that there's no real need for dialectics uh, if you're coming from an analytical perspective. You only get a need for it when you start looking at the real activity of what an individual does and the way that that activity is itself dialectical, the way that the world is taken in and then put out through praxis. Um, he then moves on to probably what is some of the more important, uh, differences between, um, idealism and his form of dialectics, which is to bring in what he calls the practical inert, practical inert, and this whole deal with, uh, the way that human beings socialize and form groups is through material reality and that this, you know, from, from moment one of even thinking it is necessary for the external world and material reality to be part of that. So that's pretty much where we got to. We talked a little bit about machines in the last episode and how machines act as a uh, sort of counter uh, counter praxis or hexis and that they um, they are opposed to the division of labor so whereas the division of labor divides individuals into isolated units that perform a function machines bring all the functions together and make the people external to it uh, so yeah. Um, anything that you think I should expand on there or do you want to jump right into chapter or book four? Well, maybe that's a good place to say that, uh, it's not just that they are external to those machines, but in taking up the work of those machines or on those machines next to those machines, they're becoming other than themselves. That's right. that's a really important part. There's a lot of layers of talking about others who are other than themselves, and um, that can start to be very confusing. But I think in the sense that, like, obviously the workers are not the machines. That othering can be very plain. But then in the way that, like, the machines have a kind of end that is not the same end as the workers. Uh, even an individual worker who is at work to get a paycheck or to meet some some more immediate needs, that that's not the same goal. It's not the same end as the machine. And so even in clocking in, you end up taking up the the uh, the ends. You you end up uh, becoming part of of the process that that machine is a part of. And you do it willingly. And so I think that's where like, uh, 
it, it's like the freedom is this this balled up thing that's so complicated and has has these these ways that it leads us back into um, participating in this othering, but also is the potential for us to get out of of this perpetual um, being othered than ourselves. Yeah, and also I guess I should have mentioned it just in the recap the idea of the future and you know temporality in general is always really important for Sartre. It's the way that he argues for freedom as a possibility to begin with in dialectics or dialectical reason what he's going to say is that uh you know we're part of a ongoing totalization we're not part of a totality. There's this open-endedness. And part of the dialectic, the dialectic, is the future. That futurity or that part of temporality is what makes the whole whole, in a sense. Um, and I don't know how much he emphasizes that later, but he's really insistent on it in the beginning of the book. Well, yeah. So I think that uh, on that point about temporality is exactly how we can start understanding the the uh, the concept of seriality. So this has to do with the way that uh, the world is experienced and reproduced in series, meaning. Um, uh, so, so like we could start with this idea that, like, like you said in your recap, that uh, Sartre's first step is a regressive one, starting from that individual, and that that individual is in a situation, in a kind of context, and that's a very, I mean, most anyone who's familiar with Sartrean uh, thought at all uh, can can grasp that part of it. That even even other people who are are familiar with phenomenology, that's a pretty uh, basic uh, starting point. Is a a kind of individual in a context, but the temporality and the series really comes in when we see that context is always temporalized in a series. That context is not just starting from nowhere, and it's not just floating in space. And so even it is, is serialized. Um, what that means is that uh, contexts are kind of generic in the same way we talk about the machine, right? So even the concept of a context becomes a sort of uh, thing that we decide to other ourselves in order to use. And in doing that, we're, we're sort of, yeah, we're only left with tools and and. Uh, ways of participating in the world that are like uh, taking up the next step in that process, a process that's just already happening. So everything you kind of think about doing is already just another, another process, uh, another step in that process. So, yeah, let's go a little bit more into this idea of the series. Um, I know he introduces it a little bit, at, at the beginning with this example of waiting at a bus stop. And uh, the idea there is that, um, you know, no one's waiting at a bus stop without being in this particular society, in this particular point in time. There's always already this entire history that has happened and has constituted the situation in order for it to even be possible for waiting at a bus stop to have any meaning. Uh, the other, but then he goes on to point out, you know, there's a certain way that, uh, um, there's a certain kind of social mode that waiting at a bus stop is, and he calls that mode seriality. So, uh, the way that he thinks about this is that once you are at this stage of capitalism or whatever you want to call it. Um, you become an isolated individual. The isolated individual is like where he begins this from. And he wants to ask, use this example to explain how it is that isolated individuals become groups or become collectives at all. And 
what he says about the bus stop is, well, it's the bus. The bus and the meaning that the bus has for the people waiting at the bus stop is what makes them a group. And this is a material thing. It's a bus. And it is a shared goal for everyone waiting there. And because it's a shared goal, what he's pointing out is that it's an internal relation. People aren't related to each other externally like molecules would be. It's not like, uh, you know, you have like, um, you know, this shaped molecule and that shaped molecule and they fit together and that's why they're related. It's that within in each individual, they have taken in the meaning of catching that bus into their projects. And so that brings them into a group, but yet they remain isolated. Or, or pseudo isolated, he'll say, because, so, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that um, if we if we zoom into the part of that that is the the um, taking up just the next spot in in line, what, right? What that's doing is like you're not taking up that spot as you. You're just taking up that spot as whoever's the next person in line, whether you're fourth or fifth or sixth. And then when the bus shows up, either there's enough spaces for you to get on or there's not. It's not going to ask who are you, what are your interests, uh, yeah, like what's your past, you know. It, that's not what's happening when you're getting in line in that sense. You're right. choosing to become a kind of abstracted, generic thing. And and what it, what it does is it, it almost turns us into, yeah, a kind of tool, right, who just is a... Uh, um, like we talk about uh, the metaphor of being a, a cog in a in a I know, a wheel, or like like a be, being a um, a tooth on a cog or something, and and this idea that like like you said, like it kind of fits into something, but it's not the way that a, a molecule fits into something. It fits into it because we decided to change the way we're shaped in order right. to fit into that thing, not because we already did fit that. And I think that one way to really understand uh, seriality is in um, tools, but then in, additionally in like technique, right? So like um, uh, you could think of something like uh, baking bread that could seem like an activity that like, you know, I'm bored. Let's bake some bread. Like we'll, we'll make some bread at home. Uh, or maybe we're really hungry and we have the ingredients to make some bread. Let's make some bread. Or maybe I'm at work because uh, I work at a bakery and I need to make some bread. In a certain sense, like that that recipe is about to just be this generic series, right? No matter what the context is, you just sort of pick it up and follow the recipe and make the bread. But then, so, so there, there's this kind of like getting in line of just, getting out the ingredients and starting the process, right? Preheating the oven and all the things that go with that. But then there's also this kind of like room in there where you can sort of do it differently. And that's maybe even where you could make it wrong, right? Where the bread could not come out. But that also implies that there's a kind of seriality and technique, right? Of doing it right. Of not just the seriality of the recipe itself, but the seriality of doing it perfect right like not like like not getting a shell in the eggs when you crack them or whatever other things are also part of seriality of the recipe but aren't in the recipe they're exactly in that kind of morphing our, ourselves into playing the role right and so you know if you went back to like early sarja this would have something to do with authenticity right where he talks about roles and he talks about playing the waiter or uh, being on a, a date and taking up these sort of, you could call them techniques or you could call them, I don't know, uh, scripts that you can form to and use it as an excuse to tell yourself that you're not really making a choice. Um. I, I don't know. He'll probably brings that into this, but um, it's just worth noting that that is still part of his thinking in this. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's a. I think like 
I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how those exactly, you know, carry over. But I think that they're good examples of of a sort of social series that that yeah doesn't seem as obvious because it's it's manifested in a kind of uh, cultural technique, right? Cultural script that is not uh, productive in an economic sense. So it it doesn't seem as obvious that it's um, reproducing something, but this goes into another aspect of seriality and um, Sartre's concept of, of class and this idea that the interchangeable, we're, we're interchangeable members in a series and that series is our class. We're not just members of the class in an analytical sense, right? The category of that class. We're picking up the role that's like the next step in continuing that class. There, it, it is a it is a process that has started that we find ourselves in, and so in that way, it's like this: uh, we're we're connected as individuals serially as a class, um, and we we pick up that position in the series freely. And that's how we reproduce it. So another point that he makes about seriality, which I think leads a little bit into the next item uh, you wanted to talk about, was that seriality, because it makes us interchangeable, also turns people against each other in a sense. It's a threat to uh, to you if someone else cuts in front of you in the bus line or it's a threat to you if you know someone can take your job so it produces uh, an antagonistic uh social existence where not only are we isolated individuals and not only do we become like find our meaning outside of ourselves uh, in the material world, but we also see each other as potential enemies almost all the time. And, yeah, uh, and in that way, maybe like uh, we could see how passive, what he calls passive activity is a sort of defense mechanism of that, right? It, it has to do with like uh, doing like, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, what we might call uh, masking, uh, in social situations, I think has to do with with uh, taking up this seriality in a way that's like uh, seeing what makes sense in that space or trying to project what is wanted in order to uh, um, like not not actively be doing something we're we're meaning to, but instead to subsume ourselves in the next step that's like expected that, that uh, isn't awkward or that like um, is more comfortable. And I think that, um, and like you said, like this idea of, of other people being a threat, it produces a passivity in, on a massive scale because it's, it's a way of not, not revealing ourselves as threatened by that but also asking others to also not threaten us in that way. And so I think that something I, I, um, I learned in this reading that I found really important is this idea that the passivity of the masses is serial. It's not moral. It's not, it's not them being uh, not class conscious or something even, right? It's not based on that. It has to do with like, there is a series that they don't, all they can do is is pick up the next step in and that there's a there's certainly like a historical materialist like marxist way of trying to understand that as being a uh, predictable unfolding but an important part of this is that it's our freedom that's reproducing this so it's also like we started talking about from the beginning it's also our freedom that is our potential way out of it can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by next step? Uh, I know, like, so, like, in ordinal thinking, 
you know, you have the number one, you have the number two, you have the number three, there's an order, there's steps. Um, is that also what Sartre is saying when he's talking about a series? I, I think, but not necessarily in a way that needs to be labeled in as such. It's, it's not, doesn't need to be labeled uh, with a number. It, it is just um, like we talk about, like with the, the temporality of, of context and um, uh, the simple fact of like chronological development forces things to be ordered. So I think like, you know, maybe from a, from a, an anarchist perspective, we could understand what Sartre is saying by series as just being ordered. And so in, in a very simple way, like it just means like uh, if we say like social series, then that would be like kind of like saying social order, right? Or um, if we said uh, organizational series, then it would be kind of like organizational order. So in, in a certain way, it, it means order, but not in, a, not in an analytical sense, right? It's not a map of, from above. Instead, it, it is a sequence because even making the map from above happens sequentially. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we uh, got that. How about, was there more to alterity that you wanted to talk about? Yeah. So when it comes to uh, how we can interchangeably take up that role, this is how it can happen on a massive scale. Is that and, and like you said, like we're individuated by the system. We, but we're not individuated as ourselves. We're individuated as generic individuals who can plug into that. It's how we're reproduced as workers by uh, popular education and popular culture. Um, so, so we can think of if we think of seriality as this this order, but it's also like impotent order, right? Like we, we can't do anything about it. It just is there and we take it up. So alterity has to do with how everyone else finds themselves in that same situation. Like, oh, there's just the next step there and I can pick it up. And uh, that's, that's kind of the only choice I have is to, to do that. Or like, I think you and I have talked about in other discussions is like with, with the idea of kind of just uh, ungovernability the idea like, Oh, well, I just won't take it up. Right. And, right. but, right. but the point is that like, that's also part of the series. So the series series alienate individuals from themselves through that alterity and from the ends of their actions. Right. Just like, I mean, when you go to work, you know that you make more money for your boss than you make for you. And that's that, that simple fact can be, radicalizing for people from a lot of ideological backgrounds. And sure. so, so yeah, like, like this, this idea that, that um, you can just tell your time isn't spent on like your things that that's very uh, simplistic way of seeing that imply and, and that you could get fired and someone else could get hired that you could go get a different job. You could work for a different boss, all of this interchangeability. It's part of what makes the series so powerful, the, the series under capitalism, this, this seriality that we're forced in under this system. So um, a good example of this is that obviously words are serial, right? We had to put them in order in order to make a sentence. So okay. we become serialized when we speak. But it's actually in our understanding that we experience the alterity. Because it's it's a uh, part of the meaning of the words. It's how those words could be used in a different sentence to say something totally separate, right? So we have alterity as speakers and listeners. One of us could be speaking and one of us can be listening and we can change the, the roles. We could be uh, reciting the script or trading off who's reciting the script. But the words are also uh, have this same degree of alterity. And it's in that way that like, um, yeah, like we're saying before with the baking the bread, anyone can pick up the recipe, right? And even anyone can do the recipe enough times to practice and develop the technique, right? Everything is there to be um, 
um, entirely uh, interchangeable. Even if it takes time to become interchangeable, we see the world as like, oh, I'll practice that, right? In order to right. become the next step in the series. Uh, so uh, the next term, I guess, would be individual praxis. Um, kind yeah. of went over that, but I guess. Well, so like if if we think about how like uh, like we're saying with this ungovernability, um, just sort of taking up one other possible step in the sequence, the one of like not taking it up or like passing on it or something. Um, there's there's this idea that you know maybe you could have a subjective take on on that series, right? This kind of countercultural position. But that that even that subjectivity knows that like oh uh, it, it sees this the series as being uh two choices and like continues the series by just taking up one of those two. It's kind right. of um like uh, uh walking with your right foot or walking with your left foot and like you could shuffle twice with the same one if you wanted that's not really a, a obstacle to moving forward so individual praxis can can be um uh, entirely subsumed in in thinking that you're doing something for yourself that doesn't have your ends actually in the action itself. I think that a good example of this in a contemporary society is like uh, going to college or getting an education in a way that like um, there's nothing good or bad about doing that, but it, it has nothing to do with some next thing that's uh, uh, really presented to you. It, it's just sort of another activity to do. Um. Okay. And and so uh we see that like like freedom is presented as like oh I'm not good at at taking up the series. I I could get good at it, right? It it's an obstacle. So every time we have an obstacle to picking up that end of that series, that's where we start to exercise our freedom. And what we when we're looking at individual praxis, what we're seeing is that as an individual all I can do is take up the, the end of the series, whether that means like repeat it or do the rebellious thing and like, you know, don't repeat it. But I actually can't on my own break out of that series. There, there's no, there's nothing I can do except fill the next step. I can take the right step or I can take the left step, but all I can do is, is step in this series. Right. And that's, uh, you know, very important for a lot of different reasons, because it implies that, uh, you know, for revolution or something like that, it's not just about doing something totally different. Um, right. Right. And so so um, and, and it can't just be a, um, a pick something really different for its difference. Right. Um, I think so. You have a few other terms that I know you wanted to go over. Um, I'll just list them out real quick so that we could uh, pick which ones you want to talk about. There's alienation, counter finality, passive activity, impotence, group formation, intentional action, and group praxis. So uh alienation is the next one down the list but any if anything fits better go for it well so i i think uh we could definitely think of this this question because we've touched on it already around uh how is it that even with advancements in technology or even with like uh there being the means of of meeting people's needs that people that most workers remain poor and it has to do with the fact that like the the series that we're a part of is a series in which 
most workers remain poor. So there's not something an individual worker can do to break out of that. That inability to try harder or to worry about your own context more, I think, is part of what we what we experience as that alienation. It's kind of our freedom already having a destiny, even if we sort of, you know, um, feel that that's wrong. Um, it's it's kind of a recognition of like, yeah, I don't even matter here, you know. I could just be anybody or I could be anywhere. And that interchangeability to us in that context is experienced as alienation, as a problem, right? But if we think about, like we were saying before, like that freedom is defined in that obstacle, I think what we're trying to do here is see alienation as an obstacle, something that produces a new kind of freedom to, to like, yeah, to, to deal with to deal with it, to like try to address that problem. Um, so um, one example that, that they use, and I think this is kind of important, um, is, is media alienation. And the way that you hear uh, the person on the radio or, you know, maybe in a more contemporary context, we hear podcasters, right? And they're saying like, like, um, kind of a generic thing about whatever's the current event or the, the cultural like uh, uh, thing going on right now. And uh, they're making comments on it and they're uh, producing words, but they're producing words that need to fill the series of the podcast, right? Like literally just to keep it going. And so right. what we're listening to is actually someone else othering themselves in order to become part of a series. And so what we do in order to be good, you know, listeners, good audience members is to other ourselves. And so even our interactions with other people are so alienated that we're others interacting with others in a way that like, yeah, maybe it looks like something uh, it's depicted in like a future dystopian, like sci-fi thing where we're like, you know, not not in physical contact with each other, but only only through like uh, robotic uh, extensions or something like that, you know? Yeah. Or maybe like the comment section of a video would like be a good example of this sort of way that people other themselves to fit in the series of the algorithm of commenting on videos. Right. And, and you, you find yourself interpreting, like adding stuff in that's not there in order to make sense of what is there. And that adding in starts to create a kind of uh, other of even what's there, even what's present. So, so that you, you, yeah, you, you don't get um, like from a phenomenological perspective, you're not dealing with the phenomena that's, that are there. Instead, you're you're creating new phenomena uh, and projecting them into that situation. It allows you to, uh, uh, yeah, mold yourself into being like what fits into that context to keep the series going. And so, yeah, we bend backwards in all these different ways to make that happen. But we're really good at it. We're we're so good at it that we passively do it, and that's where the passive activity comes in. Is it's habituate habitualized praxis we've we've memorized how to do it it's a performance we do without even worrying about it yeah i mean i know every time that i try to advertise my show in the comments of a video people don't like it uh it's just kidding but it's there's a re uh, just an example of a way that these behaviors are reinforced and uh you know habitually we become adept at following these uh, protocols, even as commenters, even as anonymous commenters. Right. And yeah, cause, cause yeah, you could, I think that the anonymity is actually really important because maintaining that is part of the, like the art of doing it. Right. In the right. sense that like art is fitting into the perfect thing. It's part of the technique of doing it correctly and well, and, um, yeah, like, like, uh, having the right zing and like, uh, knowing like how to push someone and like all of these things that go along with that. And so, you know, something we didn't talk about before with the alterity is, which I think it, it relates to a, a very contemporary context 
is that part of that interchangeability, I think, is is really related to ableism. And this idea that like we're projecting how interchangeable something is, right? And essentially, if you can't interchange into the series, right? If you're not capable of being a productive worker, if you're not capable of, uh, of uh, you know, participating in the dominant culture, then you're you're not just um, othered because everyone's othered, right? But you're actually just not factored in. Right. You're you're just not part of of anything. See, you, when you look out at the world, you don't even get to see series that you can go take the step in. It, nothing nothing looks like uh, even a, a passive activity to do. Right. And well, that's a really good example. It's like in the you know the history of madness or whatever, uh, or this the way that capitalism kind of created a new kind of ableism that led to the the diagnosis of madness and led to people being institutionalized just because they're blind or deaf and uh, couldn't be productive members and their families were no longer able to give them a role within the household because they weren't able to survive based on their household activity anymore and kind of things like that. Yeah. And you can um, see how, how like a, a sort of liberal politics picks that up and assumes that like, well, if we could get those people to be part of the alterity, then they could also be part of the series. And that's the most important thing, right? Is that, that form of inclusion and that inclusion is inclusion in the serial reproduction of class, right? Of class society. So you didn't write it down, but I, and maybe it's because it was discussed like immediately before the beginning of this chapter, which was Sartre's idea of class being. And uh, I don't remember what he said about it, but um, I was hoping maybe, you know, since it's going to keep coming up, maybe we could talk about it. I, I think that, uh, I don't I don't remember specifically um, uh, how he introduces it in that section, but I, I don't think it, it comes back up in in this section. I think that the way that that class being is presented in in this section is uh, around the idea of reproducing this the series and okay. this potential of uh, it. it we're we're kind of arriving again at like if if alienation and impotence are are obstacles and we're able to articulate them as such and see them in all these different parts of of society we can also see how um there there are new new projects that could be uh, come up with that are not part of those series that are risks, let's say, um, that, that step outside of that. And so I think that, yeah, in, in maybe, maybe in this sense, like, um, what he's talking about with class being has to do with the passive activity, right? It, right. it has to do with activity that even if it's what we want, it's activity that we're already practiced at that, that, isn't taking that risk that isn't uh confronting an obstacle instead it's it's just avoiding the obstacle right because like uh like you said before you know we feel threatened about like you know someone cutting in line but to a certain extent we feel so threatened about losing the order of the line that we might just ignore it you know that like just because that that fear even is realized, we might still not even react to it because the best way to deal with that uh, passively could be to just keep being passive about it. And, and that um, trying to react in a situation um, maybe produces presence in a way that like um, our impotence doesn't, doesn't prefer. Right. Like, like to a certain extent, like keeping the series going a lot of times means staying back. Right. That that's actually our role in most of the serial reproduction is 
just being passive spectators. Yes. And like we said with the media, it's like being good passive spectators who are other than ourselves, who are not seeing things from our own perspectives even, just from no perspective, from, from this made-up, uh, um, serialized perspective. So let's, I, you know, I, I think really the thing that we want to spend a lot of the time on here is talking about groups. And so let's start uh, getting into that. Um, there's group formation and there's group praxis. And I think these are the two things that are going to start really uh, giving us the groundwork we need to relate this to anarchism. So, uh, yeah, I think that the, the argument here is that the seriality and alienation can be removed locally. This doesn't mean like locally in a geographic sense. Obviously, this isn't a kind of localism. It has to do with like in a context, right? So we, we talk about how um, uh, this regressed perspective is in a context and that that context is, is temporalized. It's in a series uh, that's sequential. But this, uh, this next step in even that series is not certain. It's why it depends on our freedom, right? The freedom of, of those masses to keep reproducing it. And it, it, is, it is because of that that the, the, the potential for a change in the system is in the masses. It, it is in, in the, the people who are applying their freedom to complete that right now. So it does, uh, um, I, I, like we talked about, I think last time, the way that like the, the, uh, the presence of our history. And, and this is really important with group formation because the seriality is like the, it, it's part of what, what has led us to this, but it, it is not um, that, that, that same series is not the one that's just in front of us. What's in front of us is what we produce with our freedom. So the potential for group formation has to do with like a, a new kind of alterity, a new kind of interchangeability in a series that we haven't started yet. In a series that would, would not include the uh, ruling class, right? Would not include private property or would not include other things that have reproduced this system. So um, what it means is that like uh, group action, like uh, coordinated doing something. Uh, if we go back to making the bread, right? There's all kinds of ways where depending on who's around and who they are, they may be really helpful in making the bread, right? But they might not be, right? It might exactly just be this like conflict and like is actually just an obstacle to making the bread. Either way, like... Um, the the ability to make the bread is like tested in if the bread comes out right so like even falling uh into some other series that doesn't lead to bread is like an abandonment of that project or a deviation from that project and these deviations could just fall back into that big series again like individual praxis and so uh the idea is that we could through coordinated effort take up a new series that we don't know who's going to need to be interchangeable in that series. But we don't know that it's going to, it's not going to be guaranteed that it will be kept up. That that's where, um, yeah, you know, in, in revolutionary movements and social struggle, uh, it, it could be easy to be uh, discouraged because we don't know who's going to be taking up that next thing in a series we're trying to begin but that uh, the idea of getting out of the seriality, getting out of the instrumentality of the world is like the, the goal is, is exactly not what's being argued here, right? Like it's all about like, how can we use the fact that even the systems series is not guaranteed to be the beginning of us coordinating against just that passive role? using some kind of form of, so like we can, we can contrast the passive activity to the intentional action. The intentional action is not just uh, saying like, oh, I'm not going to take up that series. It's 
taking up a new series. There is no, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to be part of a series, right? There is only like uh, instrumentalizing what's there for something else. It's in that way that uh, the, that bread that's being made could be sold in your boss's store, or it could be used to feed an army that is uh, surrounding the boss's house, right? And, and that the, the point of that bread is a part of that coordination and what series it is a part of. It's not in the bread itself. It's not in the recipe itself. It's in how, how did we form? Did we, did we just realize that series through individual praxis? Or did we realize it through the formation of something different that could fade away? So I know from secondary literature, one thing they that's been pointed out a lot is, you know, Sartre seems to think that the reason why groups form out of a series is basically that something threatens it, right? So uh, I don't know if this holds up within the text, uh, within what Sartre writes or from your perspective of it, but um, what the idea is that, you know, when you're part of a series, uh, there's not usually a reason to stop participating in that series until some disaster happens or there's uh, some kind of threat to the continuation of the series. And then people kind of have to think of some other way to go about what they're doing, whether that's just a living or like, you know, whether it's innovating a new way to do some kind of like uh, manufacturing procedure or something like that. Um, so uh, the what the secondary literature I've read about that has said that like there is sort of a determinism in that idea that group formation is inspired by these sort of accidents or uh, outside threats. And I'm wondering if that's the impression that you got from reading the text or if that's uh, maybe off. I think that... Um... I understand that interpretation, but I I don't share it, I guess. And I'm trying to think of exactly like um, maybe how to refute it. But yeah, like I, I think that so what 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 I wrote here is about how um, the collective, which is the what we're saying here, like the capitalist system or the system that we, we live with now, the series we're all a part of that series has like, as I've been describing kind of these points where we, we see like uh, what happens next. Right. And what we could think of is maybe like a, like a net. And so that net like uh, holds things into it, but it also has holes in it. Right. It, it is porous and it is in those pores where, because we actually can contour ourselves to fit into what we need to, we can fit through those holes. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to do is, is learn to uh, not pick a hole and like go find it, but realize like, oh, there's holes all around me. I haven't been exploiting. I've been uh, taking a shape that doesn't fit through the hole. And that on my own, if I fall through the hole, I'm just going to get like kind of fall back into the, into the net again. And I need other people to kind of help like, a, yeah, maybe make like a, like a chain, right? So that we can get way farther away from the net. In that sense, like I, I think that what they mean by threatened is not wrong, but that maybe we don't need to think of it so much as like this life or death survival. A big part of this survival is that like it's habitualized, right? It's actually part of the passive activity, this like, got to get back to work. Like uh, the only thing I can think about is like reproducing my life that I don't even really want. And that I can see isn't working for even me, you know? 
and uh, the 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 um, the idea of yeah that the porousness. So so like we've kind of been talking about it as if like the end of of this sequence is is like not certain, but there's another way to think about it where like it's not as opaque as it looks. There's actually like kind of ways to peek through that uh, are are part of where groups are forming and where their action is aimed. So it, it's both things at the same time. All right. And then, yeah, the other, the other thing is that uh, Sartre really thinks that only groups make history, that history isn't made by individuals, although they're important, uh, that it takes a group to, to, I don't know, retotalize in a way that uh, impacts the greater totalization or whatever you might want to call it that is history. So the, the way I've been thinking of this is that um, we actually, so, so intentional action is this commitment to a new series through the alterity, not in spite of it. And what that means is that like, uh, we, we actually need a high degree of interchangeability amongst people in order to produce like uh, new, new contexts instead of to just be uh, uh, reproducing the same context or the, the next step. So what we, what we actually need is, is uh, people to be able to um, pick up that role. And whenever, whenever people um, are working on their own, whenever you uh, are not taking up a series in a project with other people, and I think this is where the information aspect is, is so important, is like it has to do with committing to a project that isn't certain, that kind of taking it up and like uh, risking that it doesn't happen is what... Um, that's what puts us in a context that we see as free instead of a context that we see as already destined for something. We need the, that risk involved in it and that that risk is involved in taking up the step and not knowing that someone else will be taking it up after you. But individualized praxis doesn't, it, it, it can be a large thing, but it is isolated in a way that it, it, it's not part of a new series. So all it can do is be like a spectacular next step in the series that's already unfolding. And, and I think that um, what we're trying to do with group praxis is like uh, something more, more practical, first of all, and more practical than individual action, because we can, we can feel the impotence when we try to uh, react individually. Right. But right. I think that like in our current context, we can only imagine organization also being impotent. Right. We can't really imagine anything except impotence. Right. And let's. Yeah. So let's talk about organizations. And did, it, did this uh, cover institutions as well? Or is that later in the book? Uh, no, I think that that, that comes up uh, somewhat later. I think that it, okay. it touches on it a little bit. But um yeah, like I, I, one thing I was really concerned with in, you know, spending this time on this and then like even as it started kind of making some things click for me is how this text can just fall into the same seriality, right? Like we can just be making another podcast and we can just be talking about philosophy in this certain way. And in any way that we can break out of that, it comes from us seeing that as an obstacle and trying to make it somehow um, relevant to our context or to, um, yeah, for, for us, relevant to a, a kind of anarchist practice. So uh, to a certain extent, this is like, um, yeah, like uh, more interpreted than the rest maybe of what I've been saying, but I, I in no way was the rest of it not interpreted, right? So, um, uh, what I've kind of grasped from this is this idea that like, yeah, we can only see organization as being impotent. We can also only see ourselves as being impotent. So 
that's not unique to organization. That's not a reason against organization. So if we think about the way that like we need a new series to be established and that's not something an individual can do with their own action, organization's not really an option. It just is a, a fact. And so what we need it to be is a kind of instrumentalized alterity, right? Something, some kind of interchangeability that we are able to use, right? Not, not in a generic sense, but to do whatever we're going to do, right? So like uh, to go back to the bread, if we're trying to make a lot of bread, then we need to be able to um, uh, take take turns, take shifts, right? We need to have more than one kitchen producing the bread. We need to uh, be able to um, deliver the bread through different means. Um, we need to be able to um, calculate the bread and keep track of it. All these things go along with that. And so the interchangeability of who's doing those tasks and uh, how they're organized has everything to do with um, uh, something that could be part of a project, not, uh, not just passive, right? Something, right. a new project that we don't know is going to happen, something we, we mean to have happen. And, right. So, right. So this is sort of, this sort of ties into like, this whole idea of whether or not an organization is oppressive or because of this way that we alienate ourselves in them by creating series or creating functional roles or creating, you know, our own, uh, our own prisons in a sense that we insert ourselves into. And so, you know, I think what Sartre is arguing here is that, yeah, there's more to it than that. And that, uh, you know, you have to look at a bigger picture than even that in yeah, order to, yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, to fit with this out, uh, like interchangeability that's intentional from an organization, what I see could be, it, it, what we're, we're, we're kind of getting at is that militancy is an intentional seriality. It's, it is seeing the next step that needs to be taken in order to continue in the series created uh, to, you know, use the interchangeability of this organization and it's doing that next step. So it is us contouring ourselves to fit what the next thing is but it's not just some next thing that's random. It's the next thing in the project we're trying to work toward with other people. And that, that again, only happens in this very local context in, in a sense that like we can't just come up with principles to be working for, right? That, that intentional action, just like the passive activity, can't just be the result of morality. That's not the, that that one factor is not going to be the the pivot point of whether we're able to break out of the series. The motivations behind it don't matter as much as the actual being able to, able to coordinate and realize the new series. So in that way, militancy is not about who takes it up. It's about that that next step is completed. It's why it's oh. required. So let's put that into like, you know, some, use some examples from anarchist history or anarchist now to try to start getting into the uh, really the anarchist part of this. Um, what would be an organization, an example of an anarchist organization that has uh, maintained itself or directed itself in this way and why is that a good example? So I, I think that this, this is important uh, and not at all exclusive to anarchist organization. The point is that like in being a member of, of a group, you are uh, interchangeable with other members of the group. And through voluntarily doing that, you're, you're committing to the the practicality of that, that interchangeability somehow, somehow that's something that's useful. And again, like, yeah, in our, in our current like culture, that's hard for people to grasp, but because we've seen like, we don't have an individual path of doing it. 
that, that just is not a way out of, of anything. It's not a way to produce this uh, transformed society. So we, we uh, in, in terms of like a speci- like a, like an anarchist organization, I think that you know if we were to just take up the example of of the Black Rose, and we were to say that like uh, the idea of that as an organization is to have people who can be part of the struggles the organization is engaged in. So the organization is not uh, an individual. It also doesn't have its own action. Its action is individuals choosing to take up the organization's uh, series, right? And that series is its program. So this this relates actually a lot to like this this next point is is strategy. So so if militancy is this seriality and commitment to taking up that next step, strategy is about like. Um, uh, serialized action but it's also instrumentalized seriality so we 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 can see how it is steps in a process right so like a a political program a strategy for what to do is steps to move into a future that like we said is not certain and taking up the the next tactic that needs to happen to keep it going is exactly what the militants will do that's what the militancy will consist of is keeping that series going. But the the strategy is also learning how to instrumentalize the fact that we think in in series so that we're not just stuck in series. Suddenly strategy is us imagining series out of things. It's imagining series to new ends. This is really important because it's through strategy, I think, that like... uh, Ser- seriality starts to be something we use. It stops being something that we're just stuck with or that that's so dis- like um, discouraging. So, you know, one of the insurrectionary kind of individualist uh, criticisms of organizations is basically that they become self-perpetuating machines that uh, lose touch with the actual revolutionary movement or potential of, of society or even just of uh, what anarchists are trying to do. And uh, I know the book hasn't gotten to it yet, but what Sartre refers to that kind of thing is, is as an institution as opposed to an organization. So uh, an institution is when, an organization ossifies and it freezes up and its roles are no longer um, subject to change based on what the members at the time want them to be. Instead, it becomes like a totality that you can only be part of and never change. And it becomes its own, it takes on its own counter finality in that way and becomes opposed to praxis. Um, So with that, with this idea of the institution being on like one bookend and the idea of what Sartre calls a group infusion on the other, which is kind of like an affinity group, uh, in between that is this idea of the organization. And I think that clarifying what it is about that kind of organization that still has the potential to uh, practically realize freedom uh, is really important. And I think in anarchist discourse, it's sort of the, the uh, one of the things between the organizationalists and the anti-organizationalists that gets looked over. Yeah, so I, what what I have been relating to to this is these uh, like anarchist principles of self management and direct action. So the way I understand this is that um, the organization is an 
the organization is is different from something like an affinity group because it is formed out of imagining a new series out of projecting itself into a new series but that like yeah in a really important way the organization has no body right it it needs uh it needs militants to be its its actual uh actors and so in in a way that like um this relates to self management has to do with uh organization forms out of um, exercising our freedom toward a new series and our freedom comes from an obstacle. So yeah, like we said before, like if we want to call it being threatened, that's, that's kind of fine, but maybe what we should think of is like, it's not just us being threatened. It's kind of like the, the stable, like uh, everyday life that's, that's being threatened. The, the normality of the way things are. So by taking, by, by seeing a problem, by acknowledging it uh, collectively, like uh, in, with a group, um, we, we become organized, I guess, like when we decide to try a solution, right? When we become solution triers instead of just problem havers, that's, that's an important step there. Because again, like we talk about with individual praxis, you can't really be a solution trier. You can sort of just be someone coping with the problem because all the solutions you can try are already decided by the series. They're, they're just the next step in the, the capitalist series. And so in a way that like we can acknowledge a localized problem and become triers of a solution for that problem, we require organization because we require more than one angle to try that solution. We require more than one uh, instance, more than one person's effort. Um, and and in that way, like, yeah, I think that self-management is actually like a really important part of this because instead of just being collected in society, like in, in again, as being just people who have a problem, we become unified around trying that solution. So the, the difference between collected versus unified. Yeah. And so another, the way that I look at that is, so the group infusion is responding to a crisis. So it's responding, you know, it's spontaneous. It's like all of a sudden the normal series of everyday life is broken by, you know, like uh, an invasion by another country or like some other real crisis or, you know, Sartre is usually hyperbolic uh, or dramatic in the way that he describes these things. But so I'm going to be as well. But um, he uh, so a group infusion is really uh, maintained by everybody that's part of that group having that external thing that they're responding to. And uh, what happens is once that thing is no longer a problem for them, then they could either dissolve back into a series or they could become an organization which creates its own internal, um, uh, like... I would call it alterity. Yeah. But so... So in the organization, cohesion isn't is no longer maintained by the external threat of like the invading force or, you know, uh, the boss or something like that. Rather, cohesion becomes maintained internally to the group and it's maintained through what he calls fraternity terror, uh, which is kind of like saying militancy or commitment. It's this idea that. Um, you know, because the group is in danger of dissolving back into the seriality that it initially responded against, now that that is now that they've reached that point, they then have to uh pledge to each other that they're going to commit to the project of the group, and that's that's the organization is this committed, pledged um uh 
cohesive group that takes up its project and uh, is committed to seeing it through and also becomes its own, like polices itself basically and enforces its own membership by, uh, you know, whatever, you know, in the extreme, like a blood oath or like some kind of real, like uh, severe consequence if you are to betray the group or something like that. But obviously these are uh, extreme examples just to demonstrate a more mundane point, which is that all the mechanisms that uh, made the group infusion cohesive have now been internalized into the group as an organization. Yeah. And, you know, um, if, if we can think of this um, internal cohesion, I think as, as being like, like a, uh, I know, I know it comes up in, in Sartre, but also in the Catalano about uh, all universality being practical. So even within that organization, the idea that it is useful, that that that, um, that, that terror is real, actually also has to do with um, that, the practicality of that unity. That, that the organization is still working toward that uh, that uh, solution or toward this this other series and hasn't followed fallen back into a reproducing reproducing of passive activity. So as long as it is still um, the best, like I think what we could think of in our context is like until something like a let's say like a tenants union, is able to be um, imagined that is useful for tenants, then the skepticism that's there is not just ideological skepticism. It's, it's practical skepticism. And that that practical skepticism, it, it's not solved by saying like, oh, and that's why that doesn't work, right? It, it, again, I think that that's where like... Um, uh, if we talk about at the beginning, this this falling back into the analytical categories, it doesn't help. Just just saying like that is this, and so because it's that that that's why we can't do it. We need to be able to understand like how and why, and in, in order to again break out of the series, right? That even us picking up these tools, they have nothing to do with like what they're inherently designed for. They have to do with like us already having a project and looking around for what to do to realize that project. It changes that practical inert into a field. So uh, this is this is really important because I think this is what relates to the, the point about direct action, which um, I think is about the realization of potential freedom of that practical inert. It, it has to do with seeing the, the immediate material world around you as being things you can grab at to keep working toward that trying that solution and not in a way that's just toward individual uh, ends or individually imagined ends, but actually within that organization, right? Like through that cohesion that we're talking about being inside of that, the unity around trying that solution so that like in a, in a practical sense, being willing to try the solution doesn't risk everything because you failing at that attempt is someone else in that organization able to learn from that attempt in order to try the next thing. That's again, why we need that interchangeability in a really important way that I think like in a practical sense refutes that kind of anarchist tendency to, to not want to organize or to be skeptical of organizing. That we, we need the organization even for there to be a validity to that experimentation because it's in someone else's interchangeability to use that experience. That that experience isn't owned by us, right? It's not just personal. The, the, our experiences need to be able to be organizational. Otherwise, like uh, we're, we're the only ones learning from them. It, it becomes an autobiography. Right. And then, you know, the danger or the warning 
of what Sartre is getting at in a lot of this is that, you know, an institution, an organization has the risk of becoming an institution when it creates its functional roles and those roles uh, are prioritized for the maintenance of the organization instead of uh, the organization creating those roles or those functional roles for the project it is pursuing. So, you know, I, like, I don't know if we'll ever read volume two together if we're going to, you know, cause it's like, this is so massive, but you know, he takes this, all of this into, you know, a progressive analysis of Stalinism and, you know, what it, what exactly it was that made that, such a totalitarian nightmare and uh you know made everyone just subservient to this sort of machine and this is sort of that danger that he's warning about that an organization faces where you have to have this balance that you don't want to get too into yourselves as an organization that you become an institution and perpet and the institution's perpetuation becomes more important than the revolution or the, the project. But you also don't want to fall back into seriality or mere group infusion either. Yeah. And I think that that's again, like why I think that the, the anarchist principle of direct action is really relevant here that, um, I think it's it's a big part of how an organization engaged in revolutionary action doesn't fall into just strictly becoming an institution or even beginning to imagine itself as an institution because it, it's needing to connect uh, two uh, specific acts that themselves are um, isolate like intentionally and explicitly isolated steps in the series right like they're they're uh it's recognizing that it needs to take steps that it's not and it goes back to like strategy being serialized action but also instrumentalized seriality it, it is the actions being put in order but it is order becoming a tool becoming something we use because it's us being able to see like ah, we need to get to this step still until we can like do that next thing. And we haven't gotten there yet. And without that evaluative process, we're not able to um, um, stay engaged in the context. We become engaged in, in a, a, a passive activity, right? So I think in a certain way, like once an organization has created the potential for passive activity, which we could see in, in a, um, like in this circumstances being kind of the opposite of direct action that that direct action has to do with being connected to that context in a very material way so like uh something that that has helped me and this relates to something that we we talked about in um a recent project we were doing with the center for especifismo studies and that relates to like um if we think of struggle as being passive activity so this is a habitualized, like just struggle is just a fact. It's just the condition that you find yourself in. Struggling is like, yeah, molding yourself and wiggling around to fit into what you need to do, right? And um, so in that way, it's it's also impotence, right? It's, it's your freedom entirely about like molding you to be what you need to survive. Um, so struggle is, is habituated survival, but terrain of struggle becomes a, f a practical field. It becomes a, 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 a material field where there are, are means that you can use for intentional action. And right. So like, instead of looking at the streets as a place to go and obey the, uh, the protocols of shopping, if you're in a shopping district or like, I don't know, whatever kind of districts there are, isn't everything a shopping district now? But, um, you know, the streets become an instrumental field that you can use for a demonstration 
or you could use for some other kind of direct action that is, uh, uh, you know, you have now become an active uh, agent in this sort of, uh, in, instead of, you know, exactly what you're saying, instead of being a passive, uh, what the hell is the word you use, the passive... Uh, um. But passive activity or passive, yeah, passive activity. actor or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Passive participant. And, and so like, you know, to relate this uh, specifically to uh, especifismo, what comes up is this idea that like, yeah, even in these organizations in these mass organizations, those are terrains of struggle. They are not the solution for the struggle. Right. So when we get back to like, uh, how does an organization not fall into being an institution? It comes from militants struggling inside of that organization, not not having perfected it beforehand and designed it or like watching it fail and then going back to the drawing tables and deciding to draw something different. It has to do with struggling inside of a terrain. Learning to see that that struggle is not just the sequence it's it's a it's a field and because it's a field now it's problematized in a way where we can become solution triers and you can already see how like as soon as we are able to imagine the world in that context uh we can't actually even remember the old series anymore all we can see is like possible series in front of us that's like uh it, it, the the impotence fa fades away right the, the impotence is is immediately like um itself an uh useless or irrelevant that that impotence only fits when we're talking about that series that's been going on before it doesn't fit anymore when we start to imagine a new series impotence is like a an excuse or a boogeyman or something right like oh but what do i do it starts to be like a reason for not acting instead of um and and again that goes back to um, this idea of the the passivity of the masses is serial it's not moral in it, it's like uh, it's not because people are being bad or because they're being lazy or because they don't have the right ideas. It's because the only series they can see is the one that is is uh, reproducing the way things are. And until we can start to see a new series being something that we can interchange with and we can. And, and again, that happens on a local level. So it's not like you're going to come up with something and be able to show it to everyone and. It's going right. to click for them, right? It's going to be them being part of that experience themselves. And th yeah, there, there's there's not a way we can um, uh, model it uh, universally because it won't be practical universally. What? So you have something about theory written down here. What? How does theory fit, in, fit into all this? So. Um, Part of part of the idea here is that when when action is passive activity, the point is that it's it's over determined. It's like, uh, oh, you're so free because you went to Sonic and they have 3000 different combinations of drink that you can order. But that even like adding another thousand options is over determined freedom. It, it's not actually like o open. It, it's not. uh it's all still just like uh, like we've been saying, like um, uh, picking up that series. And and in that way, like, yeah, like we can see how, you know, with technology, with algorithms, like the the complication of the, the options seems so fast that it must not be overdetermined. But that it's just kind of able to compute even more over determination. And so the idea with theory is theory is intentionally underdetermined. It needs actually to be like uh, uh, put into a series. It needs to test itself through the alterity of moments trying to apply it. So it's it's in its application that it becomes determined. And in that way, like uh, theory is a is also an instrument, right? And if we think of theory as being this determined tool that we already know how to use, then it's, um, 
it's only going to reproduce the series that we, we are already a part of. But if we see it as an instrument that we can use to help determine our own situation, that, that it's, it's a, a tool without a technique yet, right? It's a, it's a tool that, that finds its technique in its application. Um, maybe a, another example that we haven't talked about with um, uh, the seriality and the alterity could be around um, uh, art, uh, visual art, and maybe like using paint. And this idea that like, as a painter, as an individual artist, you actually don't have a way of making something new. You have a way of making like kind of what is there to be made, but that as part of a group infusion, there could be a sort of an artistic movement that that actually starts to produce new series that uh, are able to use those same materials in ways that weren't possible before and wouldn't have been possible just on one's own because you actually need larger ingredients than just yourself. You need exterior ingredients that are part of that practical inert field. You need other artists who are part of that movement with you. I think that that's what Sartre gets into with Flaubert and this idea that like uh, his realism is the result of that context. It is not the it is not just uh, his ideological uh, realism that he rejected that also. It was it was something that was seen onto his work because of the ingredients of the context. Uh, that's yeah. Same same idea can apply to like technological design, which, you know, I'm not a technological determinist. Uh, you know, I, not in all ways, I guess. <laughs> um, the, because I understand that there is a design process uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one way or the other. But um, basically the same thing you're saying about art there is techniques in design that are ready-made and lead to the same kind of outcomes. You okay? Hold on. I lost my hearing. So, yeah, I think art is a great example. Uh, and mm. it's interesting that, you know, when you look at art history, what you see a lot of the time is that new art forms do come out of groups where you're talking either talking about cubism or surrealism or dadaism or any of this punk whatever it's um not usually an individual contribution alone it's definitely a group praxis and right. and, and i think that like uh um I think that even anti-organizational uh, uh, anarchist tendencies would actually agree with that or, or actually in their own analysis arrive at the same thing, that um, culture happens collectively, right? And, and so in that sense, like um, taking that up intentionally is not in any way like, um, I don't know, contrary to uh, some more natural expression of freedom. It, it is a, a situated expression of freedom. Right. So um, I don't know how many anarchists are anti-organizationalists anymore. I know that when I was younger, it felt to me like it was most of them, uh, at least here. And that doesn't seem so much to be the case anymore, which, you know, I don't know how meaningful uh, Sartre's work on this is, uh, is at the moment. But I think there are some other things that we could pull out of this. Um, and especially when it relates to Marxism and Marxists and some of the tendencies that, uh, you know, in Sartre's time and now, Marxists have towards a mechanical dialectic, mechanical materialism or 
mechanical determinism. Maybe this is a good way to understand, uh, you kind of think back of what we were saying about theory, uh, the difference between a tool and an instrument in this sense. And I think that what, uh, what Marxists are doing is they're making tools, but that they, they are not always concerned with how those tools are instrumentalized. They're not always concerned with how they're applied. And what I have, have uh, learned in the Especifismo studies is this idea that, that theory is a tool because it needs to be applied. Uh, and it's in that application that it becomes an instrument because we're using it for trying out a problem or for, for, for trying to solve a problem. And that I don't, I think that a lot of times um, Marxists make a sort of theory that is very ossified and, and modifying that or applying it through modification or through a mutation, you know, through transformation or interpretation those things are often criticized as being not using the tool instead of an instrument, an example or an instance of instrumentalizing the tool. And so I think what a lot of times uh, Marxists can end up arguing for is taking up the series that's already there, right? A kind of passive activity within organization. And right. I think that, yeah, like what this starts to maybe do is allow us to, to critique their, their practices without needing to get into Marxism. It, it has a lot more to do with like, okay, that's a tool and you have this point about that thing, but in order to use it, we need to like put it somewhere or we need to have a, something where we're in the middle of. Right. Cause this definitely is not a critique of Marx, uh, this book. And, um, there's very, you know, there's some things Sartre will say Marx didn't really flesh out enough, but he's really going after, you know, the PCF and, you know, Marxists who have towed the Stalinist line when he was writing it. So, uh, yeah, which would they be guilty of what you're saying, which uh, is to take this ossified theoretical form and just try to apply it without understanding where praxis fits into how central that is to dialectics. If you think um, about how a tool is used different by, you know, different crafts people, like that seems really obvious that like, oh yeah, you don't just, you know, use a screwdriver for just one task, right? Sometimes you pry something open with a screwdriver, right? And and the idea that you are not supposed to, like like Marxism is somehow not supposed to be instrumentalized in that way, is I, I think like a really fundamental disagreement with anarchists is that like anarchism is the instrument, right? It, it, that's the whole point is that it is useful, and if it's not useful, then it it has done something wrong. It, it is it is almost according to some anarchists, cease to be anarchism, right? That it, it either is the useful practices collectively coming out of that context, or it is some kind of charade. It's, it's something claiming to be that that doesn't have any relevance and isn't, isn't growing out of that. I get, like to think about, like we're saying with the practical inert field, like this terrain of struggle, we don't see uh, uh, Marxist theory as a tool in that terrain of struggle. And that's not to say that it, it couldn't be a helpful tool there. But I think that a lot of times we could end up fighting with Marxists about whether it's a helpful tool that could be picked up or whether it's the path toward like the next thing is like everyone training on this tool. And that, that kind of... Um, trying to sell people on how practical something is, is trying to sell them on how universal it could be instead of people seeing the practicality and in that practicality, that being the universality. Like we said before, the cohesion inside of the organization, that cohesion is this unified aspect and that is unity around a practicality, not just around uh, um, allegiance to something. It's allegiance right. to a practicality to something useful. 
And then on on the other thing is also, you know, dialectical reason doesn't have to only belong to Marxists. Right. right. Yeah. And that's uh kind of anytime I anytime I'm talking with a Marxist, that's what they'll want to throw at me. And it's uh, it's a hard thing to uh, uh, understand what's even meant by that when they're they're saying it to me, because I, I don't have any sort of uh, formation in an analytical tradition other than just growing up in the U.S. And so, like, uh, I'm I'm uh, certainly not developing my own interpretation or my own methods for for uh, developing these things don't come through uh, some kind of analytical process. And yeah, to just sort of be labeled like that is exactly them trying to take this position of like, well, we're the ones with this one tool and no one else can can use that. that right. There's no way their opponent could be instrumentalizing that tool in the in the conversation or in the debate. Yeah. And I think the most damning thing that Sartre says or does with this book is shows that, well, the dialectic is rooted in praxis. So no one owns it. Right. It's not. It's, it is the lived reality of praxis. It's not just a theory of like uh, history or something like that. It's, it's apodictic certainty comes out of the lived reality of what praxis is. So uh, on that note, I think, you know, I think we've covered a lot of ground. We're almost at two hours. And um, I guess let's end on a fun question. If you were going to make a decision based on what you've read from Sartre so far in some kind of organization, what would it be? I think it would be seeing that sometimes maybe we're outside of a situation that we project ourselves to be inside of and learning that like maybe uh, we're in a position of solidarity, not in a position of action. And that that's an important realization and situational description that we could, we could arrive at. So like, yeah, kind of a, uh, I can see how it's easy to say, we're the ones inside and, you know, like our ideas have developed out of this context, but that sometimes we need to be able to see like, oh, that context is happening and we're us looking at it. What position do we take with that? Right. Cause it can't just be this kind of like, then I researched it all. I looked all online and now basically I'm inside of the situation or if I was, this is what I would say. And it gets back to that like internet comments. Right. And, and so as an organization, we don't want to fall into that. That that passive alterity, I think, is a really easy thing for uh, an organization to fall into. Also, Pro projecting themselves inside of a context instead of seeing the politics coming out of that context and deciding to support them or not. Right, and uh, that's that's a pretty good uh, response. You know, I've been saying that. Um, that condemnation is just thoughts and prayers and reversi. Like this, this whole, exactly what you're saying, you know, I mean, it's going to date the episode a little bit, but the Israel Palestine conflict that is going on right now. Uh, plenty of people are projecting themselves into that context. And, you know, the outcome is these statements, whether it's thoughts and prayers, whether it's condem condemnation, whether it's, uh, cheerleading, whatever the fuck it is, it's not action. And uh, the question that I see coming up over and over again with people I talk to is what is there actually to do? Uh, which I think came up a little bit with the Ukraine uh, Russia conflict that's going on, but I think it's, you know, it seems to be at a different pitch right now with Israel Palestine. And yeah, like I, I think that that from from Sartre, what I would grasp is that that asking what is there to do needs to start from our situation, not from the situation we're not in. Because you can see how what we do is we project ourselves into no space somehow. 
which means like in that uh, no space, we're taking up the series that's already there. Like we're, we're playing the roles that are there. We're not making a new project. And that even that, if we want to genuinely ask, like, what is to, what, what can we do? Like, we need to be able to uh, turn that question. The, the answer to that needs to be able to be a project, not just a list of possibilities. If it's just a list of possibilities, then you can see how those possibilities are also just impotent uh, seriality. It's so much so that they're on a hypothetical like timeline, right? They're not even real. Yeah. Well, excellent. Uh, you know, next time we do this, I will postpone instead of not reading the section we're going to talk about. It's just, again, you know, stuff is so crazy right now that uh, that's what happened. The, <laughs> this book will be there. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Keep in touch if there's anything else you want to come on the show and talk about that you're working on. Definitely open for that. And uh, if you have anything that you're working on now, you want to tell the audience about. Uh, uh, yeah, just mostly uh, with the Center for Especifismo Studies, um, we just finished a new project that we call the uh, North American Anarchist Primer that will be published soon. Um, the first part of that is called First Grade. Um, and then we will be doing our annual militant kindergarten starting in January. Um, you'll see flyers, uh, you know, kind of in all the typical uh, anarchist online spaces. But also you can um, email us at uh, especifismo studies at gmail.com. And yeah, you can get the, e the information for how to join or uh, yeah, any other questions or contact things. Awesome. I'll also put that in the show description so that people don't have to try to, you know, hear it and type it out. Uh, cool. All right. I'm going to end the recording and then, uh, yeah.